Well, as you know, the world continues, even though we've been gripped with the pandemic crisis, the Conservative Party of Canada is still proceeding with its leadership race. In fact, this Friday is the cutoff for new membership sales if you want to vote in that process. We've had the pleasure of interviewing several candidates for the leadership, and the first candidate to sit down with me has joined us again. Her name is Dr. Leslyn Lewis, and she joins us now via Skype from her home in the greater Toronto area. Dr. Lewis, welcome back. Nice to see you again. Yes, likewise, Ezra. Well, Thanks you've been so busy. I've been following you in the media, and I've been following your fundraising because that's a measure of your success. I have to say, very strong fundraising numbers. Tell me about uh, how the campaign has gone for you because just from seeing your media coverage and the fundraising reports, you put in a pretty strong showing. How are you feeling about it? Oh, it's great, Ezra. And we were one of the last to start uh, fundraising off of the list. So our numbers are not even for the full period as the other um, candidates. And our we've just been doing phenomenally well. And it's largely a grassroots based movement where people even, you know, uh, Elderly people in their 80s are sending $25, and um, it's just the the sheer numbers that we're bringing in, and just the the fact that people are seeing me as a very refreshing candidate. Well, I think that's outstanding. Listen, I want to talk to you about the uh, issues of the era. I mean, I think this pandemic came out of the blue. I don't think anyone was expecting it. How would you rate the response to it by Justin Trudeau and the federal government. Uh, what do you think they've done wrong and what, if anything, do you think they've done right? Well, to be honest with you, like we could always look backwards and hindsight is twenty twenty. but I think from the outset, early on, I was very, um, very concerned about some of the approaches that we were taking. I would have closed the borders earlier, repatriated Canadians back home, and then put them in quarantine. And I actually was the first candidate to voice concern over the fact that when we were urging our government to close the borders, that they responded by saying that it was racist. And so I actually was the first to come out and say, no, this is not racist. This is public safety. We have to put Canadians first and we need to instill mechanisms that will make sure that Canadians are safe and that the virus is not spread. Mm -hmm. I think one of the broader questions, and you see it in other countries too, particularly Australia and the United Kingdom, is that other Western democracies are reassessing their approach to China, whether it's to allow China to put in 5G technology from the Huawei company, or even just, I don't know, talking about Taiwan uh, as a closer ally in the region as opposed to just communist China. Do you think that Canada should reassess our foreign policy towards China? Uh, should we reassess as the Americans are, reshoring industries that had put their factories there. What would you do, let's say we're out of this pandemic, 6, 12, 24 months into the future, what do you think Canada's stance towards China itself should be? Well, I mean, we really haven't reassessed our foreign policy in over 50 years, so I think that we do need a comprehensive reassessment because we... We, we're now in ad adversarial trade relationships with countries like China. And so it's changed from an amicable trade relationship to one of a, an adversarial one. And so we really have to start reassessing how we relate to these countries. And we've learned that transparency is not always there. We had some very serious concerns about the slow reporting and the transparencies and, and just China's connection with the WHO. And so we have to start... Um, making sure that we have our own policies in place, that we could check numbers and that we could make sure that the information that we're getting um, does not put Canadians at risk. Mm -hmm. I, I have a question for you about one of Trudeau's moves that uh, he did sort of taking advantage of the pandemic crisis, I think. Uh, and I'm talking about his gun control initiative to ban about 1,500 
particular types of firearms. Now, it, some of the types he was banning were so obscure, I don't even know if they exist in Canada. But still, putting through firearms legislation without a vote, without a debate in the House of Commons, without committing studies, um, do you have a reaction to that? Does this uh, strike at your views on firearms? I don't think we talked about this in our first conversation. Do you have any thoughts about either the substance of Trudeau's gun control or the manner in which he pushed it through? Absolutely. I do feel that he was capitalizing on the Nova Scotia tragedy. And it's very, you know, it's very disconcerting because we've seen that the ban was enacted through regulation and not legislation. And the, the latter would have required a debate. And so they've foregone that debate. And because of it, uh, many law abiding citizens are now criminalized. And we have, you know, really interrupted um, many small businesses who are now stuck with ammunition and sporting facilities who no longer can have individuals trained for international competitions. And it's just, and, and it was just with a sweep of regulation, which I felt was um, infrin an infringement of the democratic process. I, I want to talk about um, another issue. Thank you for that. Uh, over the last few months, we've talked to a, a few of the candidates running uh, for the conservative leadership. And uh, one, and maybe two of them, maybe three, I guess, have faced uh, a vetting not by the conservative party membership. I'm switching gears here a bit, Dr. Lewis, but rather by the party's leadership um, executive decision makers. Here's what I mean. Jim Carahalios, who we interviewed, uh, sent out some mailing to party members, and he was suspended as a candidate, not by party members, but by the party executive. Uh, Derek Sloan facing uh, similar criticism, uh, and, and there was another candidate who didn't really get out of the gates. I wonder if you have any thoughts on well, what I regard as cancel culture, or knee-jerk censorship. I, I'm not. I'm certainly not asking for you to praise your competitors or your opponents in this race. But I, I wonder how you would deal with fellow conservatives being a little bit prickly, offending this or that sensibility. How would you balance freedom of speech and allowing other uh, members of the conservative party to express themselves versus party discipline? Because it's. It's something that's concerned me. And I, I wonder if you have any thoughts on that subject or if you've just sort of focused on your own campaign. Do you have any thoughts on Jim Carahalios, Derek Sloan, or others? Well, I think it's important that the party allows the democratic process to unfold. And so in such a situation, it's the members that really should be deciding on who they want to represent them. And unless something egregious was done, um, I don't believe that it's the party's you know, place to intervene with the, that democratic process. Have you had any conversations with your fellow candidates, either Carrie Halios or Sloan or Peter McKay or Aaron O'Toole? Have you, I mean, I, I know campaigning has really been shut down for a month or two because of the pandemic. I'm just curious if you've had any friendly interactions or maybe unfriendly interactions on the hustings. Have you bumped into them or talked to them? Well, actually, no, because we've done, everything has been via Zoom. So we've all been focused on our own campaign and just reaching reaching members on our own. Uh, but we do, I mean, the campaigns do speak amongst each other about various issues. <laughs> um, I remember when we first met, and I very much enjoyed uh, your visit to our office here, uh, you felt like you were ready to rumble, but it certainly did feel like your first big political fight. It's been a couple months now. I'm just curious how you felt about the experience. Is there something that surprised you? Is there something that uh, has um, been a positive surprise, or has it been tougher in some ways than you expected? Uh, you're a little bit more seasoned now. You've been roughed up a little bit by the campaign trail. What are your thoughts now, having been through it for a while? <laughs> Well, you know, it, the funny thing is, is that people who you expect to be your allies, people who likely have the same policies as you, you feel that you see that they're the ones who are trying to destroy your reputation and undermine you. And then the people who you thought would be your opponents are somewhat more um, respectful of you. So that that came as a bit of a surprise. Hmm. 
Um, let me ask you a question about what I regard as the toughest party in Canada. Of course, the Liberals have been successful two elections in a row. But I've always used the phrase the media party to describe the establishment legacy journalist who typically support the Liberals, who have a uniform point of view on a lot of issues, whether it's social conservatism or global warming or even firearms, as we talked about. Do you have any thoughts on your experience dealing with the mainstream media? Uh, did you find that they were more open to you because you don't fit the conservative mold? You're a, a black woman in the conservative party that perhaps dashes their stereotypes of the party. Have you had uh, any thoughts about how the media party has treated you? Well, I, I can see that they don't know what to make of me. That's that's very apparent. And um, But to be honest with you, the interviews that I have had with them, with the mainstream media, have been equally tough. They've asked equally tough questions. But I feel that, you know, it's just the manner of which I was able to forthrightly answer those questions that I wasn't, they weren't really able to trip me up the way they may have tripped up somebody who they could label um, a, a certain way that they cannot get away with those same labels being attached to me. So it's almost a form, it's almost as if what you're saying, it's a reality that my presence um, does serve to de-weaponize some of the attacks that we usually get as conservatives. That's very, very true. Mm -hmm. I see uh, in some opinion polls that Justin Trudeau has risen in the polls, and I think that's just a, my own reaction is that's a temporary boost because there's a feeling of national solidarity and let's get behind the leader. I think we've seen that in some other countries as well. I, I predict that'll subside somewhat as we get through uh, the, the panic stage and we deal with the real problems of the deep unemployment. Um, if you were successful and became the conservative leader, what do you think your main issue would be as opposition leader, as conservative party leader? And if we were heading into an election as soon as next year, what would your chief focus be taking it to the Trudeau liberals? Is there one thing you think they're particularly vulnerable on in the minds of Canadians? Well, I think that in general, we need to focus on I, the top three things for me is just looking at our economy um, and our democratic va values, our sovereignty and our Canadian identity. Th those three things I think that we, we need to focus on because there has been fractures within our confederation and we see that there is a large amount of regional discontent that we have to resolve and I believe that a lot of that is undergirded by the, our, the, the way that our economy is structured and a lot of um, imposition of foreign interference on our national sovereignty. Let me ask you one more question about that because I think you're right, before the pandemic hit, one of the issues that was really acute was Alberta, the oil patch, the pipelines, the big oil sands mine called uh, the, the, the Tech Frontier Mine, the, the, the blockades of the railways. I felt that Alberta in particular, and Saskatchewan too, was feeling very marginalized and almost being driven out of the country by the Trudeau Liberals. As the pandemic recedes, I think some of those issues will reemerge. Have you had any c contact with provincial uh, leaders in Alberta or Saskatchewan? Have you talked to the oil and gas industry at all? Uh, have you heard what their concerns are? Have, do you have a message for them? What would you say to Albertans and other Westerners who are talking about a Wexit to leave Canada? Hmm. That's, there are a lot of issues that Albertans are very, very concerned about. And, you know, the, the issues that they have raised to me are the way the senators are selected, the number of senators, the number of individuals that are in each riding, that, you know, there's far more individuals in a riding in Alberta than in other provinces, and um, equalization payments are the three top ones. And, and then the, the final one is just the uh, their ability to sustain themselves and to develop their natural resources, and just this undermining of their economy. And, you know, you have various parties that are pit against the the development of their nat natural resources. And, you know, we had Elizabeth May just stating that 
bitumen is is in oil sands are dead, and so that industry is dead. And and in fact, th- that is not that is not factual because we know that currently, uh, you know. Canadian sales are 120 billion um, a year in bitumen um, worldwide. And so there's a lot of potential still left in Alberta and we need those resources and we can develop them. Well, listen, I have really enjoyed our conversation today and it was very nice to have you. Uh, if I recall, we were, I think, one of your first media interviews when you started the campaign. So it's nice to close the loop with you as we head into the final stretch. What's your website for people who have been wondering if they should get involved? Uh, where should they check you out to learn a little bit more and buy a membership if they want? Actually, Ezra, you were my first. Uh, of- <laughs> well, thank you for that. And it was a deliberate attempt to make sure that, um, you know, networks like yours and and the work that you do is recognized and that the party recognizes that you have done a lot of work for the conservative movement. So that was very deliberate. And I'm glad that other people felt comfortable to come on the show after I took that pledge. But my website, that, that's enough promotion of you. So <laughs> well, thank my, you very I, much for those kind words. No, I, I meant it. Um, my website is www.leslinlewis.ca. So that's leslinlewis.ca. Excellent. We'll put that on the bottom of the screen and we'll put that on the page as well for people to click. What a pleasure to see you again, Dr. Lewis. I wish you good luck and I'll watch with interest as the leadership contest continues. Good luck out there. Stay safe. Thank you. Take care now. Thanks for having me again. Our pleasure. Thank you. Well, there you have it, Dr. Leslin Lewis, a leadership candidate for the Conservative Party of Canada. And you can find the link to her website under this video. That's an excerpt from my daily show, The Ezra Levant Show. Every day I do a monologue on the news of the day, then I interview an interesting guest, and then I read my hate mail. You gotta subscribe. Go to rebelnews.com.